Today, we're going to get a full tour of a P-51 Mustang from a current pilot. So let's go through the cockpit, learn the history, and see the details of one of the most famous aircraft in history. All right, we're gonna get an inside look at the P-51 Mustang here at the Commemorative Air Force Air Base, Georgia. And this is John Carrenti. John, what do you do here? I'm the operations officer at Air Base Georgia and fly most of the aircraft that we have here and real excited to show you around the P-51. John's going to show us around today. Let's go check it out. Well, first thing, one of, one of the questions that he asked before was how do, you, how do you get up in the airplane? And you could put a ladder up in the back, but really the best way is if you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, main gear here, you've got a little tab right there that we could step on, then up on the wheel, then up on the side brace, and then up here getting up on the airplane so that's probably the best way to do it i'll show you here cool and then once we're up we kind of like to get over on the walkway right here which is textured it just makes sure you're not going to slip if there's any oil on the wing and it's also good for keeping the paint kind of fresh uh we don't want to be stepping on all over it cool let's go get in the cockpit check it out now, while we are getting into the P-51 here, I bet that you wish you could hop in the Mustang cockpit yourself. And while I'm afraid you can't join us in this one, you can do the next best thing. Fly a P-51 Mustang using the sponsor of this video, War Thunder. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, with more than 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships to use in dynamic and multiplayer battles. Each vehicle is incredibly detailed and modeled down to their individual components, just like the real cockpit you're about to see. It's available on PC, PlayStation 5, or Xbox Series X and S, and all previous gen consoles. Plus, all of the recreations you see in my videos are actually filmed with real TJ3 History viewers, just like you, flying on War Thunder. So, if you would like to join, flying as a P-51, or using a German anti-aircraft truck, or a Japanese battleship even, and everything in between, then come download War Thunder for free at the link below and get a huge free bonus pack with premium vehicles, premium account, and much more. Help us save history and come fly with me. Thanks again to War Thunder, and now time to hop in the cockpit. All right, uh, John, you wanna show us how to get in here? Okay, basically, a little bit of an acrobatic act, but climb up, get on the chute, and then we climb in. Obviously, before I would climb in, I'd make sure that everything was shut off, no battery on, no magnetos on, and I had checked that prior to doing this, so we're in good shape right now. The actual cockpit for the uh, Mustang is, I won't say it's tight, but it is cozy. Everything comes to hand very quickly. And it's very utilitarian, meaning everything's where it's supposed to be and designed to do what it was supposed to do during the war. If you look at this cockpit that we have in here, um, later on, privately owned aircraft, uh, they kind of modified the cockpits. They modified the, mostly the instrument panel, make it a little bit more modern. And then later on, as we started getting into the 90s, uh, individual owners wanted to put it back to what it looked like at wartime. So it made a little bit more wartime look. So that's why this one you'll look at, and it's just kind of done more modern because it was done years ago. Um, and again, we do have some modern instruments in here uh, to help us navigate uh, and things that are required by the FAA for us to fly the aircraft. All right, taking a look here, like I said, a little bit of a tight cockpit, but it, everything fits pretty close to hand. As you come down here to the left, right here, we have our um, uh, flap handle and goes all the way from zero all the way down to 50. Uh, the next thing that you see here right here are the, actually some heating controls and carburetor heat, um, air filters, stuff that we really don't use down here because we're here in Georgia and it stays plenty warm so we really don't worry about that. Next as you come over here uh, we have the trim, rudder trim, aileron trim, elevator trim, uh, you'll find that guys do fly the Mustang. They got their hand on the rudder trim a lot. It's a trim aircraft, uh, so you're constantly uh, dialing that one way or the other. If you notice right now, it's set for takeoff, so we already have six degrees of, of uh, rudder trim in there to the right, and that's to counteract some of the torque that's in there on takeoff. Way down there in the bottom is the left fuel tank. Again, not super accurate while we're sitting here on the ground, more accurate while we get in the air and the airplane's in a flatter uh, attitude. 
Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting about that is, um, you know, it's a left tank and a right tank, uh, about 90 gallons in each side. And the most important thing is we just go by our clock. I mean, we could look at that and that kind of gives us a rough idea, but we really want to know what we have in the way of fuel. The best way to do it is know what you're burning and then just make sure you don't go over that time. Uh, move a little bit forward right here. This red handle right down here is our uh, gear handle. Basically pull it out and pull back and make sure that it's all the way in the up position and clicked in, the gear will come up. And same thing when you uh, put it down. One of the important things with the Mustang is we never want to reverse the gear when we're either putting it down or putting it up, you want to let it full, uh, fulfill the whole cycle. You want it to go all the way down, get three down and lock before you reverse what you, you know, try to bring it up. Okay, uh, we have the throttle um, right here. We've got the mixture and then we got the actual uh, prop control, constant speed aircraft or constant speed prop and not a constant speed aircraft, constant speed prop. So we've got the prop control right there also and everything pretty much comes right to your hand as you can see. As we come over to the further, we get over to the cockpit right now. We got a couple of lights here that uh, show us gear unsafe, oil pressure, coolant temp, and then generator off, just some warning lights. You still want to look at the gauges to make sure everything's what, wh where you want it. Uh, right now, if you go across here, probably some of the, the most important gauges in the whole Mustang. Everybody knows Mustang, Rolls-Royce engine, and it is liquid cooled. And that coolant temp uh, gauge right there is, you know, we kind of say it's kind of a lobster eye. We look at that gauge pretty much with one eye and then everything, everything else with your other eye, you're looking at everything else, kind of a joke, but you're constantly looking at that gauge. You also have a coolant pressure gauge and then what's known as the nine day clock and people go nine day clock. Yeah, you wind it up. It should last for about nine days before you got to wind it again. Then uh, most of the other are, are basic. Everybody should be familiar if they've uh, flown any kind of a constant speed prop aircraft. We got the manifold pressure here. We got our airspeed. Uh, the two blacked out ones that we have right here, again, modern, that's our modern ADI and HSI, our attitude indicator, and our kind of like our compass. Uh, then we have our altimeter right here, uh, climb, uh, turn and bank, RPM, and then we call this the tri-gauge. Tri-gauge, as you can see, it's got three separate gauges on it. And what's cool about that is it's got the oil temp, it's got the oil pressure, it's got the fuel pressure. And then from there, we've got our G-meter, and then again, something a little bit more modern here. We got a Garmin 750 in here. I mean, we're talking about a multi-million dollar airplane, so we want to make sure we're, that we can navigate and we know where we're going all the time. Again, uh, FAA requires the uh, transponder with uh, ADSB out. Uh, we've got our battery gauges, voltage gauges down here, and that's about it as we go over here. You got our magneto switch off the left and our boost pump primer and our starter, and then down here is what we use for uh, changing tanks from the left tank to the right tank. Uh, we got a lock down in the bottom for the stick, um, and we've got a T-handle there that basically just dumps all the hydraulic pressure uh, when we're on the ground. And then as we go over here to this side of the aircraft, just your regular uh, master battery switch, generator switch, our radio master to get our radios on. And then here is kind of important, our two switches for our um, coolant doors, one's for the oil, and one's gonna be for the uh, temp, uh, coolant. Uh, so most of the time we leave, that, we leave them open in manual on the ground, and once we get airborne somewhere in there, we'll put them into auto, and they'll, they'll close, and then they'll modulate to keep the temperature where we want it. So that's basically the cockpit here. Uh, again, down here, you've got the right fuel tank, so we can see that, and uh, that's, that's about it for the cockpit. Last thing right here is uh, the um, handle that we use to actually close the canopy. So we just kind of crank it closed and when we get it where we want it, it we can lock it in place. You, and you do fly with that closed. And that's an emergency pull in case we do got to get rid of the canopy in flight real quick or before we um, maybe have to make a crash landing, you don't want the canopy on. So that's where that's located right there. And uh, pretty much that's the, that's the whole thing that we got here with the cockpit that you have to do. But you can see everything's in a great place. It's easy to find um, and uh, comfortable place to go to work. I know there's no gun sight on this one, um, but can you tell us anything about what a gun sight would have taken to operate, what it might have, uh, how it might have differed with the operation or, or space in here? Can you tell us anything about that? Well, it's good. Right now, if you take a look out the front of this right here, you can see I got a pretty good view. That's the prop right now. We got some maintenance going on. That's why you don't see the cowling on the front of the airplane. 
but as you could take a look out the front, they would have an actual gun site up there. And what a gun site is, uh, initially until later in the war, it was just a reticle, a round reticle with a dot, and they can actually um, make the circle bigger or smaller for uh, at a certain range for the um, for the wingspan of the type of aircraft that they were probably trying to shoot down. And uh, basically, it was kind of point and shoot, and they knew to pull some lead or not pull some lead. What would a bailout procedure would have looked like? I know we talked about the jettison canopy. Do you know anything about that, or can you tell us about that? Well, the first thing is you want to get rid of the canopy, so we'd probably work with this uh, red handle here, you know, roll the canopy back, and then when you pull at it, just all it does, it's not a, it's not a uh, charge or anything like that, like you see in jets. It just basically releases the canopy and you know the air will pull it away or you could push it away so now you're in an open cockpit and then depending there are various you could just slow down enough and then jump out you want to jump off to the back side of the wing or you can trim the airplane so it basically wants to nose over and you're just holding it and then you kind of stand up a little bit and then let it nose over and you just kind of pop out that way you can also turn it upside down and do it that way and let it you know fall out you know upside down so uh, there are various various ways you know that you could get out of that aircraft and again this also gets into how dire a situation am I in you know is the airplane on fire is it you know am I gonna burn to death unless I get out right now or do I have some time to think about this so just cool perfect um, next question can you tell us a little bit so this is the p51d model with the bubble canopy um, can you tell us a little bit about this one, the, the improved visibility and how it might have differed from something like the B or the C? The good thing about the D model is you got great visibility. I mean, it's a big bubble canopy. You can look around, you can check six. That's really important during the war, you know, because everybody was trying to get on your tail and try to shoot you down. And it lets you look around all parts of the sky. And, and not only from a defensive standpoint, but also just being able to look around and see where the other airplanes are that are in your flight. Where's my wingman? What's he doing? And that kind of helped. When you start talking about older aircraft that had the actual, uh, you know, the B model canopy, um, it, it's just more restrictive. You just don't have the same visibility that you would have with something like a D model. And that's why they went to this. And if you look at once, you know, that happened, and I'm not saying it came from the P-51, but everybody went that way. The Corsair went to more of a bubble canopy. The uh, later model P-47s went to a uh, bubble type canopy, which is visibility for the pilots, visibility for safety. They could see everything that's going around them. And then from a, uh, a fighting standpoint, they could make sure nobody's going to sneak up on them. Um, so one of the questions I got is obviously you guys give rides in this Mustang. We do. Um, and one of the questions that I got was from an older gentleman who said, how do I know if I'm medically healthy enough to go in a ride in a P-51 Mustang? When you say medically, our biggest concern with people are, first off, can they get up and get in the aircraft? You know, and we don't mind putting a ladder up and helping them up that way, but they gotta, they gotta be able, more importantly, not getting in, but be able to get themselves out. You know, if we have an emergency or something, I mean, where I'm sitting, I'm, I'm gonna be very little help. I'm just gonna be telling him what we're doing, but he's gonna be able to have to be able to stand up, you know, once the canopy's gone and be able to unstrap himself, be able to move the seat out of the way. And we, we brief all that with everybody before we put them in the airplane to make sure they could do that. So, um, you know, if anybody ever has a question about that, we got no problem with you coming by and see what you can do and decide whether it'll work for you or not. Um, tell me, I think we kind of neglected, tell me about the actual stick and what we got there, how that works and, you know. Uh, well, well, the stick right now is locked and uh, we lock it and we lock it in the forward position, which is the top, there's two holes um, that it can lock to. And we lock it to the top hole, which puts the stick all the way forward. The reason we do that is that leaves the tail wheel unlocked. And the reason we want that is we move the airplanes around in and out of the hangar. We've got to, re we've got to reposition airplanes in the hangar because maintenance is going on. So we want the tail wheel unlocked. So when we hook it up to the tug and we've got to swing the tail around, you're not dragging the tail and scraping it and maybe damaging the tail wheel. Well, actually damaging the rubber, rubber and possibly the mechanism. So for us, right now, it's in the locked position. But if I just reach down right now and pull this out, it's unlocked. And now I can move the stick, you know, left, right, forward, aft. And you can see the actual controls. And you go out to the ailerons. And so that's how the, you know, the controls and then the rudder controls um, 
obviously are just in the back and you can see those going back and forth as I push on the rudder pedals. And that brings us into a good next question uh, that somebody had is tell us about how you deal with the torque on takeoff. That was a big talking point for, for nearly every Mustang pilot that I've spoken to. So tell us about how you deal with that. The, the airplane has a lot of torque, but the, the way to one is to realize it's there to make sure the airplane is properly trimmed for the phase of flight you're on. So for takeoff, like I said, we usually keep it at about six degrees right rudder. Um, but then the other big thing is, uh, you know, the running joke is, has always been, you never do anything fast, never fast hands. So there's no reason for operationally, or it's not good for the engine just to take this throttle and throw it all the way up forward and say, let's go fly. Uh, you'll see most guys start feeding it in, and they do that for a couple of reasons. One, it's easy to kind of feel it start going to the left, which is the way it's gonna go, and you can start feeding in some right rudder to keep it straight, but it also gives me a chance to kind of slowly check the instruments, make sure everything, make sure my oil pressure's looking good, fuel pressure, make sure coolant temps, everything's looking all right before I go take this airplane into the air. So just uh, slow movements, and if you do that, and uh, you'll, you know, all of a sudden I got some more wind, you know, we pick up some speed, you got some more wind going over the tail, the rudder's more effective, maybe I don't need as much rudder, and now I'll put more power in, I will put a little bit more rudder in, so that's the way you really deal with it. There's never, there's never an instance where you gotta take this throttle. Not in, you know, we're not in combat, we're just uh, flying for fun and flying to show people the airplane. There's never a reason to take that thing and have to shove the throttle up full, full bore. So we just slowly move it up at, at a rate commensurate with me putting the rudder in. Uh, can you tell us anything, because obviously you don't operate this in a combat role. Can you tell us anything that would be different about the operations from inside this cockpit um, in a combat role compared to what you do today? Well, they're gonna have some other switches and stuff, obviously for the guns. So that's gonna be there. Um, some of them did carry some bomb loads, at certain parts during the war. Um, so you would have those controls also somewhere in the cockpit. You'd have to deal with that. You had the gun sight. We already talked about that. Um, uh, but then other than that, it's just the training of how they were trained and how to use the airplane. I mean, the airplane, although it's great to fly here and it's fun and we can take people for rides and it's a great history lesson. I mean, those guys were, I mean, it, they were going to war. So that's, that's what the airplane was designed for. Now that trigger for the guns at least would have been on the stick, right? And it is still there. And, uh, but we use it, it's our actually radio. So we use it right now to talk on the radio. We actually have two radio switches in case the one goes bad. Can you tell us about what you guys have in the wings? And, cause I mean, that looks pretty cool. Obviously that's not the real deal, but that's, that's uh, We have a mock-up in the wings. Uh, they had 350 caliber uh, machine guns in each wing. Um, and uh, coming out the front right there, you can see that with the whole load. Uh, that they carry looks pretty cool and you know that was that was their main thing you know the whole thing with the airplane was to carry those into combat so it wasn't again to go fast or turn or do I mean it was basically you wanted the airplane to be maneuverable but you wanted to get those guns in combat and then be able to shoot down the enemy tell me about what what you're going to do here when you're bringing this Mustang in for a landing okay I just want to make sure that I got everything set me personally I like to open both the coolant doors and leave them in the open position, just get the max cooling in case I have to go around. And I know it's, especially during the summer where it's gonna be hot down low. And the hardest thing is this airplane does not slow down real well. I mean, it doesn't just quick like a bunny and you don't wanna take the engine and just swap it to idle because that's rough on the engine. So you wanna plan a little bit ahead while you're coming in, especially when you're coming into the pattern. But then once we get down to our speeds that we need to and we go into what's called the brake, you'll see uh, the airplane fly overhead and then make a left-hand turn. We're just trying to slow it down. And then we feed in a little bit of uh, flaps. Not a lot, just a little bit. Get yourself slowed down, come around turn. Eventually you get down to a speed where you could drop the gear. We'll drop the gear, put maybe a half flaps down now. And then I leave it that, that way until I'm at the uh, base position, getting ready to turn, um, coming around the final turn. At that time, I put down the rest of the flaps, make sure I'm close enough into the airport and then you just want to make sure your speed's up. I like to keep 130 to 140 around the final turn. And then as you get on final, you can pack it off to 130. And as we get closer to the runway, about 120. And then uh, basically start feeling for the runway. Pull the power off. And uh, again, nothing fast. Slowly pull the power off. And then uh, just touch down and roll out. That's about it. 
All right, last question. Um, now you guys give rides in this. Tell yes. me, tell me about what somebody needs to do to get a ride in this and what they can expect. Okay, we uh, most of our rides, uh, we what we try to do is 20 minutes. We suggest that anything more than that, it, it, it could get a little loud and a little long. Um, and 20 minutes works great. So we do a 20 minute ride. The best way to do it is uh, we have online where you can get online and book your ride. And uh, we'll call it, you know, we'll be in touch with you and figure out, you know, you can figure out what's the best date for you. We'll tell you if the airplane is down for maintenance or not. Um, and then we do rides here locally uh, in the Atlanta area, but we also do it at certain air shows. We're on the road uh, a lot. Uh, we, we've been up Reading, Pennsylvania. We were up at Oshkosh. Um, and there are other various other venues where we go out and actually give rides uh, to the public. Uh, but your best way would be online or call directly here to Airbase Georgia and they'll put you in, uh, in touch with our rides folk and they'll tell you exactly what you need, uh, what the different costs. And we only, you know, we, we do rides in the Mustang, we do rides in the Dauntless Dive Bomber, we do rides in our LT6, our T34 and our PT26. Uh, so different price points, depending on what you want to spend and what you're looking for. But we give rides in all those airplanes. Just, just get in touch with somebody here, again, on the phone or online, and we can get you set up. Don't forget to download War Thunder today so you can fly your own P-51 Mustang in one of my historic recreations. Use the link below to join for free, and I'll see you in the skies. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon so I can continue to make more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.